everyone, welcome to another edition of Manatee Cares, a 30-minute education program designed to introduce you to what services are available in our county for people in need. We are fortunate to have many caring agencies, groups, and individuals working to provide services for our friends and neighbors going through tough times here in Manatee County. But often we don't really know much about many of these wonderful resources or how to access them. My name is Adela Roser, and I am the Executive Director of the Community Coalition on Homelessness, an organization that has been serving people in crisis since 1995. In 2009, we developed a one-stop center to house our programs and to offer space to community partners so clients could get a variety of critical needs met all in one place. Today, I would like to introduce you to a couple of my staff members who provide services in two of our coalition programs at the Bill Galvano One Stop Center. Martha Childress is the Open Door Coordinator and has been with the Coalition for more than eight years. And Jonathan Gonzalez is one of our two case managers working in the Transitional Development Program. And Jonathan, let's start with you. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you came to the Community Coalition on Homelessness? Well, I had just recently moved to Florida, um, up in New York. I did some direct work where I worked um, as a direct service provider at a mental health institution for um, young children and adolescents. Then after that, I moved on to work with Child Protective Services. So when I came down to Florida, I kind of felt like I fit right in here and de dealing directly with families in crisis and under lots of heavy stress. Yes, I'm sure that you see a lot of people in crisis for sure. Every day. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about what you do at the center. Well, I'm a case manager. I work along with uh, Season of Sharing Funds right now um, to try to assist families and children uh, who are currently at risk of homelessness or who are currently homeless right now trying to get into their own stable housing. There's a lot of families out there who lack the means and the support necessary to either get their foot into the door of stable housing or families who just need a little boost to maintain their housing. So how do you actually help them? What do you do? Well, I sit down with them and I meet with the families. Um, oftentimes they come in with the whole family, they bring their children into my office and we sit down together and we discuss the problem. Um, oftentimes they have a lot, a lot going on financially and also emotionally and I try to help iron things out to see directly you know, what's causing the situation and what they need to do to resolve the situation. Oftentimes these families are facing crisis because they have fallen behind and oftentimes it's not that much. Um, one month of rent that you're behind on could cause you an eviction. You can lose your home over um, one month of rent for $650. I meet with a lot of families that are in this desperate situation that they just need a little bit of help so that them and their children can essentially save their homes for the long term. Well, um, how do people qualify for these services? Well, first they apply online for our services. We uh, do intake screening, and if they meet certain eligible criteria, they sit down within an appointment with either myself or um, our other case manager, Teresa. And then that's where we sit down and we look at whatever funding source that we have available. We use several funding sources throughout the year. And depending on each funding source, it has its own specific criteria um, for the main purpose of paying past due rent and past due utilities that are at risk of getting shut off. And also our funding sources can help people with the initial boost, the initial move-in expenses to get into housing. The move-in expenses can be extreme. Uh, oftentimes just to get set up into housing is $1,500 to $2,000 or more each month. And then all they need is just you know $600 a month just to maintain that. So what we try to do is if a family's homeless and they're having some income, we try to see if we can assist them with the deposits necessary to get into housing. And if a family is at risk of losing their housing, we work to see if we can help them pay their arrears so that they can maintain that housing and stay in a stable budget. 
Oftentimes I get in touch with their landlords directly, try to see if we can work out some kind of arrangement or some kind of payment plan where these families can maintain, maintain their home uh, with their own means and a little bit of help from the Community Coalition on Homelessness. So you're really dealing with uh, people who are really at the point of eviction, it sounds like. Yeah, um, all, along, all the, along the whole spectrum, I meet with people that can see they're going to be facing trouble next month, where they don't know how they're going to pay next month's rent. I'm meeting with people that are already in the middle of the month and haven't paid rent for that month. And then again, I'm meeting with people that are several months behind in their rent, and their landlord is essentially threatening them with eviction if they are not able to get their arrears paid up. Well, um, I'm sure everybody wants to know what some of these eligibility requirements are. What, what makes somebody eligible for this program? Well, first of all, it has to be a temporary crisis. We're not able to help families that are lacking their own income or their own means of support. Essentially what we can do is we can help families in a temporary crisis by making up for that income that was lost to help them catch up with things, but it would be up to them to work with, within their budget to maintain that. Um, <clears throat> so so if, if somebody comes in and they don't have a source of income, then we can't help them, is that correct? That's or? the hardest part. A lot of times, um, a lot of it's not even their fault. Lots of times people are unemployed or underemployed. And then again, there's families that have um, an adult who is disabled and they can't work. So these families are usually on low fixed incomes. They're on social security benefits, which is a fixed monthly amount, which is pretty much bare minimum. And then there's families who are working part-time jobs, two part-time jobs. I've met with people that had three part-time jobs just, just to try to maintain their rent. And if a family is not having the means to sustain their own household, there's really not much that we can do. And that's the most heartbreaking thing when I have to sit in front of a family and look them straight in the eyes and tell them that there's really nothing that we can do. Or I have to break the news to them that they're just not having the means where they're not able to pay rent each month. And then we have to look at option B, which is where are they gonna go to? They gotta reach out to family, they gotta reach out to friends, someone they can stay with temporarily because they lack the means to be able to support themselves. And most of the time, it's not even their fault. Yeah, this is, and I'm sure this is a very stressful job when you're meeting with people like this all the time. Um, when you have funding sources, what are some of the differences between funding sources? Like, what, what's the difference between season of sharing, for instance, or um, emergency shelter grant, some of the other d things that we get in? Well, I'll start off with the emergency shelter grant. That's one of the federal funds that we get. It's one of the bigger funds that we get also, and these funds are very restricted. With every fund that we get, it's always a specific pool of money that's meant for a specific reason. Um, the emergency shelter grant is meant only for rent and rent alone, essentially. Um, and so then, no utilities, that you can't help somebody with utilities then? In certain situations, but they usually have to be pretty much at the verge of getting shut off, which is pretty desperate. And then again, we also have the Season of Sharing Fund, which is a great charity um, that we have. And it's a lot less red tape that we have to go with. The Season of Sharing Fund is more broad in the spectrum of what it can help with and who it can help with. The criteria is a little less restrictive so that we can use it a little more freely with families who are um, in different situations. Every family is in a different, si different situation and they're all unique. They're all having their different crises. They're all having their different needs of what they need to do to resolve the situation. So the Season of Sharing Fund is our least restrictive. It can be used for things that families need, not only just rent and utilities, but also things like car repairs necessary for an adult to get to work or uh, daycare necessary so that an adult could work. Right. That's one of the bigger demands, isn't it, is what to do with the children. Um, if you're in a low-wage job, it's pretty tough to maintain them in daycare and still be able to pay your bills. We oftentimes reach out to other agencies, working with the Early Learning Coalition. Families are able to get referred there to get the child care subsidy. We oftentimes refer out to other agencies so that these families um, can get assistance from us for their rent. And then we reach out to other agencies so that they can get assistance from there for their utilities so that in the, in the long run, we work to try to resolve their entire situation, not just put a band-aid on one little thing, but we try to get them back up on their feet, essentially. 
we've been talking about this in kind of general terms, but I'd like our audience to understand um, what kinds of situations you're talking about that might throw people into crisis. Do you have a couple of stories that you could share? I have endless stories. <laughs> <laughs> One of the ones that has kind of um, just stuck with me and I think will always stay with me was this young lady I met with who was in a situation through no fault of her own, was in a financial crisis. She had no other option. She had to spend the night in the park with her two-year-old child. And then she met with me the next day, and it was just heartbreaking to sit with this woman and hear her story. She had tears in her eyes. Anyone knows when they come into my office, I have a box of tissues right at the end of my desk because when they come into my office, it's never a good situation. They're they're telling me their story. They're telling me what happened. They're telling me what's going on and what they need and what they want in order to get back up on their feet. She's just one example of the stories that we get every day. This woman who had to spend the night in the park with her child. It's heartbreaking, but it can really happen to anyone. And then there's other situations where I met with a young couple who had to spend a few nights in their car with their two young children in the back seat. And then again, there's other families left and right who are having to stay in motels because they lost their home. So they have to stay and pay by the day at a motel with their children. And that's the most scary situation when you're paying for the roof over your head day by day and you don't know what's going to happen or what's going to come um, in the next week or let alone the next day. So the, sit what the help that you can provide is not only to stabilize some of these families, which we do with our other programs, but the primary thing is for people who are sustainable, you can help them get into permanent housing. Yeah, a lot of these families are in temporary situations. A lot of them have incomes. Most of these families aren't bad people. Most of them don't bring on this trouble themselves. Most of these people are just victims of just the economy. Uh, but a lot of people are underemployed, unemployed. They have incomes, but they're just lacking the means to get on their feet. And that's what we try to do. We try to give them the boost that they need to get on their feet so that they can live their own lives. Great. And I admire you because I think that's a very tough job. And thank you for doing what you do. Um, let's turn to you, Martha. Martha is the Open Door co Coordinator. and. Um, Martha actually outranks me as far as time with the coalition. I've been there for eight years, and Martha has been here for b with us for more than eight years. Yes, what brought you to the coalition? Well, uh, I had a friend. Uh, there were some ladies that wanted to start a place like the Open Door, and they had them five hundred dollars, and that was their budget to start the Open Door. And they asked me, "Would I like to be the coordinator?" And I didn't know what that was. And we had the place down behind our daily bread in a really small little place. And uh, back at that time, when I was counting client visits and client services, I counted one month and I had almost 250 visits that month. Okay. Um, right now, when I count visits, I count that many visits in one day. So demand for services has really increased over the years. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And, and when I first started, uh, the people came were primarily uh, ground zero homeless people. And what is really heartbreaking right now is there are a lot of people that are newly homeless and, and do not know which way to go because the people that... It's, the neo-homeless, they've done everything that they've ever been told to do to make their life good and successful. They've gone to school, they've gone to work, only to have their job pulled out from under them and after that they lose their home. And, and they don't have that, uh, the skill to try to operate because everything that they've ever known to do hasn't worked. So what kind of services do you provide that helps them get back on their feet? Well, we have basic needs. That's what, that's what my end of the, of the service does. I have showers. Uh, if you're homeless, you do not have an address. Uh, you have to have legal IDs. You need clothing. Sometimes clothing that is situated just for the job that you're trying to find, like steel-toed boots, things like that. Um, but I'll tell you what, when I have a barber and you can get someone come in that's been like living in the park and they can have a shower and get their hair cut, I have a clothes closet, people donate wonderful clothes to me and I can outfit them in some nice clean clothes. 
if you saw them when they came in and they were to come up to you after they went through the whole service thing, you wouldn't recognize them when they get finished. It's amazing what a, what a nice set of clean clothes will do and a shower and a haircut. And another thing that makes them change, uh, I think the thing that I provide for them most, you can't write it down as a service at all. Because when they come and they find out that there are people that really care about what happens to them, that there are actually people there that are going to help them, it makes them look different. Of all the things that we do to make, to make their life better and to make them look better physically, that is the thing that really, really changes them. So you give them hope? Yes, ma'am. I get to do that. What other kinds of things do you have? Do you work with other partners, like um, talk about a little bit about our Goodwill and uh, Suncoast Workforce Board yes, partners? Yes, I know a lot of these. I have a lot of these people on speed dial. I know them by their first name. Uh, and the organizations in our community are so willing to help me. I've never been turned down, except for that there was no such a thing. And then even then they will say, I will look around and see if I can help you find that Martha. Uh, so people coming into the open door, can they get help with employment services there or? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Goodwill, uh, Mr. Ed Padilla comes in there. Um, Miss Molly from Workforce. Uh, we have a, a cafe of online computers and we have people like Ed Padilla and Miss Molly and they help people with uh, learning how to be interviewed for a job, learning how to make a resume. Some people have a lot of work experience but they, they don't really know how to write it down on a piece of paper. If you ask them, do you have a resume? They wouldn't know how to do that. So they come in and talk to Ed and Miss Molly. They get that fixed up. They can look on our computers and uh, find jobs that they're qualified to do. They can even apply online. Another thing, too, we have our, our mail service. If you're applying for a job online, like you have to apply for a job at Walmart online, you sit down at a computer and you have to enter information into all the boxes. If you do not have an address, they won't, it won't let you go on to the next page, you see, things like that. So the mail service is really important, the employment services, the basic needs services. Yes, ma'am. How about um, our uh, partnership with DCF? Oh, we have food stamps. I have, a, um, I have a, a staff of food stamp people that help people apply for the food stamps because see, anybody can pl apply online for food stamps. But before we had this part, this service in, at the open door, People knew that you could apply for food stamps online, but they were intimidated. They, didn't, they thought they couldn't work a computer. And, uh, and so instead of, uh, they might try once or twice, and if it didn't work, they would give up. They would do without food stamps. Uh, so I've got people, they can apply for the food stamps, and then uh, the food stamp staff, if they're panicking about why they've not got their food stamps, they can sign in to talk to her again, and she can go online and see where they're at with it or if, what happened. Um, I, call, I call them technophobes because they don't know how to, they don't know about technology. And, um, and it's real good to have someone help you through that. So they can apply for food stamps at the center um, and then <coughs> get their food stamp cards mailed to them in the mail yes, service, is that right? Yes, ma'am. So, um, Martha, you must see a lot of people also in crisis, um, people living on the street. Um, do you have any stories that are kind of, I would say, not normal, but sort of indicative of the kind of person who might come into the open door? Yes, ma'am. Not very long ago, a young lady came up to me, and she was highly upset about this or that. And we were not doing our job right. And she didn't understand how we could be there, you know. And uh, I got her introduced to Miss Becky, okay. And Miss Becky asked me about her, and I said, I really don't know what you're gonna be able to do with this young woman. I said, because she, she really is angry at everybody and everything, and she's got a spirit of entitlement, you know. And I said, Becky, try to help her. Uh, this is why it's so good that, that all of us work as a group, okay. Miss Becky helped her. As a, she's got a really good education. We found out. 
Uh, she'd been living out of doors. She didn't have proper clothes. Even if she was going to a job interview, she couldn't get up and have a shower and put on nice clean clothes and be presentable for an interview. We helped her with that. She was really amazed at how helpful we could be. Miss Becky, I have a huge place in the, in the storage area where I, I, I keep all the clothing that is donated to me. And we keep some things that are, I try to keep just things for people that live out of doors, but then I have a, a certain rack or two of uh, nice clothes for people that need to apply for a really great job that really need to look nice. We got her some of those clothes. Uh, she got a job and she likes me now. <laughs> and she's really happy and she's really glad that she didn't, that she didn't walk away because she felt like, well, it's not good. And that's something that happens with a lot of people that come. They think, uh, well, it's, well, it's not going to do any good anyway, no matter what you say. Uh, it's, this is not going to work. And I say, well, let's just try it, you know. So you really turn people's lives around there, it sounds like. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. This girl was qualified, had a good education, but she was absolute. And this is one of the things that, uh, that's in our services that we can't check off as a service. Uh, we change their mind about what is possible. That even though this, this, and this has happened, you can still move on from that. There is still something else. Well, um, I know that we only have funding to pay for one and a half people at the open door to provide our services. So how do you provide these thousands of services every month that you do for all these clients? And how many clients do you usually see in a day? Between 200 and 250. Uh, in October, I counted over almost 30,000 units of direct client services. Uh, and when I say a direct client service, that means that when they come there, that whatever it is that they ask for or need, they walk away with it at the end of the day. Um, that's what I mean by a direct, a direct uh, unit of service. Um, and people in our community get, bring me things. So they bring me uh, hygiene products. They bring me clothing. Um, so if people want to help, those are ways that they could yes, help you at the open doors to bring the things that you need or also volunteer. Can you talk a little bit about our volunteer opportunities? Yes, ma'am. I need volunteers for everything, and I need them every day. Uh, I need people in the mailroom. I need people to, that know about uh, data entry. I would like to... I need people to work the parking lot. I need people to uh, sit and just talk to people out by the computers to help uh, Ed Padilla and Miss Molly work with people that, that need to get online and do things. And we also especially need barbers and yes, hairdressers. Well, we've got one little barber. She came in and she cut 47 people's hair the first day. She got sick that next week. And so, so I won't let her cut that many uh, people's hair. Uh, and she's the only one I have right now. So if there's anybody that knows how to uh, cut hair, but th would like to come down and be a part of something really great. I'd like to talk to them. Um, how about in-kind donations? What kind of clothing do you really need? The main things I need are uh, blue jeans, uh, men's size 30 through 36. I need hooded sweatshirts and knit caps and, and gloves because it's going to be cold. I need blankets and I need a lot of them. I've got a bunch of them right now, but it's the first morning that it is real, real cold. I'm going to have to give away all my blankets. I need a good supply of that. Um, we also have uh, opportunities for people working out in what we call the, the Bat Cave, which is it's our area that we take in donations. It's an, I used to not have children's clothes uh, because I didn't have any room for it, but now I have room for it. I have a huge area that is, is made for nothing but children. I need somebody to come in there and manage that. Uh, I have several people back there, but it is huge to try to keep things sorted and sized and, uh, and clean. 
where we can put it back out, you know, in our, for our clothing service. Um, I'm going to wrap up a little bit now. And Martha, if you wanted to just give us a, one final thought that you'd like to leave the audience with about the open door and what you do there, what, what would you like to say? Well, you want me to tell you about uh, some of the phenomenal stories about my clients and how I help them. I have watched depressed, sad uh, people come and volunteer for me. And I've watched them become happy and smiling and feel useful to come down and, and do something to help somebody else. So it's a wonderful way to give back to the community. Yes, ma'am, it is. Great. Yes, I see, a lot, uh, I see a lot of happiness from the people that we help, and I get to see a lot of success in the people that come to help. And Jonathan, what would you like to leave the audience with about your program? The thing I just want to drive home is that this can happen to anyone. Anyone out there could end up in a situation where they're in need, and it might not even be their fault. A lot of people out there are living paycheck to paycheck. I mean, if you lost your job for one month or two months, even one month can cause you to lose your home if you're not able to pay rent. I mean, just to give you an idea of the volume of services that I'm working to provide, it, in applications alone, our agency in the month of October received about 650 applications. In the month of October, the Transitional Development Program has spent about $47,000 to help families get into their own stable housing and maintain their own stable housing. I mean, to put a picture behind this, there was about 108 children that were helped with these services. That's 108 children just in one single month alone that were in need of these services. And those are only the people that we could help. There is even a greater number of children and their families that we couldn't help. I mean, this is a great need that's out in our own community. If there's people out there who have money that they can donate and they're willing to donate, they should donate. These funds aren't coming from outside sources. They're not going to outside sources. These funds are coming from Manatee County and they're staying in Manatee County to help out our own community. Wonderful. Well, I didn't mention uh, our clinic and our dentist. Well, that's going to be another program. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes. But, um, we're going to devote a program to that because we've got a lot of exciting things happening with that. That's absolutely wonderful. So I would like to thank Martha and Jonathan for coming to share information about their programs at the One Stop Center and their stories about some people we have helped at the Bill Galvano One Stop Center. If you have questions about anything you've heard today on the program, you can contact Martha, Jonathan, or myself, and information will be shown at the screen on the close of this program. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about services available to people in need in our community. I hope you've learned something about what your community has to offer, and I look forward to being with you on the next Manatee Cares.